Welcome to my presentation. I'm Peter Prickertz. I'm a tech art student at Breda University and currently I'm doing my graduation internship at Tanga 13 in Czechia. I'm going to talk about the polyline creation tool that I made for the Side of X Labs Tech Art Challenge. Um, and particularly, I'm going to be talking about making a viewer state focused tool, um, some decision making uh, in the process, um, and some tips uh, on how to handle um, a lot of, uh, yeah. Uh, user input data from a viewer state. So what is a viewer state? Um, so simply said, it's interactive viewport UI and then the scripting of that. Um, what does it get you? Well, um, it, it can often be a lot more efficient than a classic parameter interface. Um, and that is simply because in 3D, it's often more simple and interactive to set up parameters. So a simple example would be if you want to have a spline and change values along that spline, you could do it in a parameter interface using ramps, um, but that is uh, often not the easiest and most intuitive way. Um, and it's a lot simpler to do it in 3D. Um, and that also brings you a lot of low level access because it's so easy to change a lot of values. Um, it's not as uh, much work to to change a lot of low level um, parameters. So in this example, you can change parameters on every single point, uh, whether or not it's uh, whether it's icing or gingerbread, and that also comes with a lot of art directability. So uh, if designers or artists want to uh, have a lot of control over something, either because it um, directly affects gameplay or simply because they want to uh, change how it looks to, to every little detail um, that gets enabled by viewer states. And lastly, it's also just fun to use. You want your artists and designers to have fun using your tools um, so they stay motivated and do a lot of good work, right? Um, and then the other thing you can do is you can put guide geometry. So that can either be visualizing a complex process so for example, if you project geometry onto something else, you might want to visualize that in the viewport. So a tech artist who's using your intermediate tool understands what's actually going on. Or you could just preview later results. So for example, if you work on LODs, you might want to be able to see the transitions between them in the viewport by just moving your camera around. So a few examples here from the past. This is from a second year university racing game. Um, and basically, we just needed to be able to change uh, banking and the width of the track and also edit intersections. So we decided against using Unreal Splines and instead used Houdini curves and then a viewer state to edit these attributes per point. This is another example, and this is a cave and mineshaft generator from a third year uh, game project at university. Um, and Basically, this is just a spline tool um, that supports intersections, and there's uh, some attributes for how much wood uh, should should be in the mine shaft, how big should it be, should it be natural or man-made. Um, those kind of things are easily editable per point. And because of session sync, it's also really fast to bring these in engine, and you can have iterations really quickly. Um, so those were two examples of where I used them in the past. and. Um, I didn't want to end up recreating a spline tool every time I make something similar to this. So for the tech art challenge, I decided to make a generic version basically of this. So the polyline creation tool on the surface, it's more or less a simple spline tool. You can create points, move points, delete points, split connections. Uh, you can uh, remove connections. You can make intersections, all that kind of stuff. Basic, simple spline tool features. Um, the, the big magic comes in here by creating these custom attributes. So here you can see that I create an entry in this multi-palm, and then I give it a name, and uh, I can set a default value. And also, if it's an integer or float, I can change the uh, slider range. And as you can see immediately in the geometry spreadsheet is that I immediately have this attribute of the output of this HDA. And right now, there's no point selected, so nothing happens here. But as soon as I select a point and then move this slider, you can see that the values changes in the geometry spreadsheet. And you can also select multiple points. And then as you can see, it changes the values on these multiple points. 
Um, and you can uh, choose if you want to only edit the active point or if you want to edit um, all selected points. So that's the difference between the yellow and the orange um, points in the viewport. And here I show a second example. Um, so this is a string and not a float. Uh, and I also can give it a default value. And then once I hit update UI, I can change these uh, the, the, the string value per point. So as you can see here, I change it and change this in the geometry spreadsheet. Um, and yeah, that way you can edit these uh, attributes on a per point basis, and it gives you a lot of control over the generator that comes afterwards. So as a simple example here, I have this uh, tree generator. So as you can see, I'm uh, just creating a spline here on this uh, pick head with uh, primitive snapping. And these are basically like roots going down the, the picket. And now I'm creating the tree itself. And once I cook the asset, you can see it places these trunks everywhere. Now, after I toggle the leaves on, um, it starts generating leaves. Um, and also on the roots here, um, I change their type to root and I change the P scale a bit. Um, and here I just add, add a new branch. Um, and that way I have a very customizable tree. Now it's not very beautiful, but I hope it gets the point across of how much customizability you enable with this and how fast you can set up some generator input, but still keep a lot of control over the, the result. This here is a second example. So this uh, goes a bit back to the racetrack generator. Um, so because of that, I wanted to be able to change up vectors um, in the viewport interactively. And I decided to go with like a look at functionality. So basically, if you have a vector um, custom parameter on your HDA, you can select that and then you are able to change that vector parameter um, with this handle that works like a look at thing inside the viewport. So how does the data, um, how do I handle the data in this tool? So basically all the points are stored in a multipalm. So as you can see here, there's the points multipalm and it just contains the position of the points. And then there's the connections multipalm, which just contains the connection between the two points. Um, and these are shown here as the IDs of the multipalm. So the parameters inside multipalms, um, as you probably know, they're called, uh, in this case, PT POS1, PT POS2, etc. Um, now, this is a bit of an issue because let's say you have a connection between point 0.5 and 6, and then you remove point 0.4. Suddenly, point 0.5 and 6 are point 0.4 and 5, and everything afterwards shifts as well. So if you were to actually use these IDs to handle the data, you would need to shift IDs very often and Probably at some point, if you have a big multipalm, you would need to edit hundreds of entries every time the user deletes a point somewhere. And this isn't really the most stable setup. So what I did is I used UUIDs. So as you can see here, there's actually a hidden uh, parameter and it stores a UUID on each point. And then the connections are actually just two UUIDs. So these are the two UUIDs of the points that are connected. Um, same for the selected multipalm or the active point. That's all just saving the UUIDs of the points. And then in the actual HDA, you can see that there's a bit of VEX code that just creates the points and then sets the UUIDs so that later I can always use the UUID to retrieve values from the parameter interface. Um, and that's exactly what I'm doing to set up the custom attributes. So at first I wanted to put them inside the point multipalm. The problem with that is that multipalms have some uh, performance problems inside Houdini. It's fine up to like, I don't know, 100, 200 instances, but at some point um, multipalms, well, the interface itself becomes very slow when you add too many multipalm instances. So what I did is I instead saved the values in JSON. And this is basically just a dictionary that saves the UUID of the point and then the values afterwards. Um, and that way I have a uh, very easy time to retrieve the values later. So that's what you see happening here. So basically I'm just going through the custom uh, attributes and I then 
uh, go through all points. I look for the UUID in the dictionary. If it's there, I take the value and put it in that attribute. If it's not, I take the default value. Um, on the UI uh, side, this all works with spare parameters. So it's not actual parameters on the HDA. What I do is as soon as the user hits update UI, I read the values from the palm setup, and then I create these uh, spare parameters uh, automatically um, and set callback functions on them. So when the user changes the value, I can automatically update the JSON. Um, and this also uh, works when, when saving the HDA, basically you might lose these uh, the, the spare parameters if you save it in Unreal Engine, for example. But as soon as you hit update UI, you get them back. And because all your data is actually saved inside the JSON, it's no problem if these spare parameters go missing. Now, as for code structure, um, I use the Python module a lot. So basically, whenever I had any, any function that I ended up using multiple times, I would put it in the Python module. And that has a few big advantages. On one hand, the viewer state is just a lot cleaner if there's less functions cluttered there. But also, you're able to use the functions from the Python module in multiple places. So you can use call them from within the parameter interface. You can call them from within the viewer state. And you can call them from within Python subs inside of the HDA. So I would always recommend put everything that you can put into the Python module in the Python module um, and only keep things that are directly related to the user interface in the viewport inside of the viewer state. So a bit of a recap and a few tips. So basically, I think viewer states are really great for keeping art directability on complex tools. Um, they allow having really complex parameter setups that you'd never be able to set up by hand um, is you would never want the, the end user to click through hundreds of parameters and adjust them. But it's very easy to generate data for hundreds of parameters when the user interactively works in the viewport. Um, one thing that I haven't shown in the presentation, but is really important is adding a manual recooking option. Um, and that is because you don't want to uh, make tiny changes like move a point around and have to recook the asset afterwards um, multiple times a second. At some point, that just becomes too slow. So I would always recommend adding a manual recooking options option for that purpose. Um, and that way, if you do it, for example, with the stash node on the output, um, you can still keep the guide geometry updated in real time, but not update the output. Um, now make your own ID system. So whenever you want to describe relations between multipalm entries, um, you should or reference points inside a multipalm, and you don't want to have any problems with shifting IDs. Make your own ID system. Um, don't go extreme on multipalms, and uh, yeah, use JSON instead if you run into any performance issues with multipalms. Um, it's a lot more efficient with with the with JSON. The only downside, of course, is it's not as good as a visual representation to the end user. Um, then use the Python module. Uh, so don't put everything into the viewer state. Um, and if you write the same lines of code multiple times, make a function for it, put it in the Python module. And then finally, and this is, I think, one of the biggest uh, recommendations I can make here is steal from side of Labs. So oftentimes you will end up wanting to create some feature that you know exists in some other tool from side of Labs. And since you can just go there and look at their code, do it, right? Like if, if there's something cool that you want to implement, go there and steal it. So thank you for your attention. Um, and I hope uh, there was some valuable things uh, in this talk.